Hello, I'm the Ever Excitable Adam, and today I'm going to be teaching you how to play Damnation, the Gothic game. You, I know what you have done, and for once, I am not the monster in this story. There can be only one winner. For the others, Damnation awaits. Damnation, the Gothic game, takes place on a plain of hell where Count Dracula holds dominion. Here, a castle of villains from the Victorian era find themselves damned for all eternity. Each day, the damned are resurrected with no memory of where they are or how they arrived, finding themselves cursed to hunt and be hunted by one another for all eternity, as punishment for the pain and suffering they inflicted in life. Each day, the damned are resurrected with no memory of where they are or how they arrived, finding themselves cursed to hunt and be hunted by one another for all eternity, as punishment for the pain and suffering they inflicted in life. Damnation the Gothic game is a brutal battle royale. During the course of the game, one by one, each villain will be slain until only one remains. Lay out the castle board, then sort the cards into decks. Shuffle and place them next to the board. Two, randomly place one death knell card face down in each of the five death knell spaces located at the top of the castle board. The remaining death knell cards can be placed to the side. 3. Turn all trap tokens face down and randomly place one on each space marked with a trap icon. Place the remaining three trap tokens face down near the castle board. Set aside the vampire board and vampire cards. Place these along with the vampire time tracker to the side of the castle board. Place the vampire standee in the vault. Players should then take turns to roll 2d6 to determine who goes first, with play going clockwise around the table, starting from the player with the highest total, the game can now enter its first phase, the arrival. It's worth noting that during the arrival, villains cannot use actions or talents, including ransack. Players cannot target other villains with attacks, actions or talents under any circumstances. To begin with, each player draws three cards from their heirloom deck adding them to their hand without revealing them to the other players. Next, each player must then choose the villain they will play as for the duration of the game. They should then receive their chosen villain's standee and corresponding board, a health tracker and three talent tokens. Next, each player will then decide on their starting location by choosing an heirloom card from their hand and placing it face down in front of them. Note that each heirloom card has a location listed on the top right hand corner of the card. This is the room that players will start from. Once all the cards have been placed, all players reveal them at the same time, placing their villain standee in the corresponding room on the board. These cards are then returned to each player's hand. Then each player draws the top two cards from the deck belonging to the room their villain is in. They must keep one and discard the other to the bottom of the deck. If they choose to keep an event or curse, it must be read out immediately. Event or curse cards that would involve other players only apply to the player who drew the card during the arrival. This ends the arrival phase. Each player should then place their talent tokens face up on the talent spaces marked on their villain board and place their health tracker on the spark marked 10. Place the soul tokens to the side of the castle board. Any remaining health tokens and talent tokens can be returned to the box. Ensure all players have read their cards and villain boards. They should all be aware of the risk of encountering the vampire, as well as entering the torture chamber and the great spiral staircase. A player's turn is broken into five phases, structured as following. Before movement, movement, resolution, other actions, end of turn. Before movement. At this point, the player should check if they have any cards in their hand or talents that they wish to play prior to moving. Movement. When ready to move, the player whose turn it is rolls a single movement die and the black die together to determine their villain's movement for the turn. The movement die, a d6, will determine the number of spaces the villain must move, their movement total. It's worth noting, villains must move the exact number of spaces equal to their movement total, unless they have enough movement to enter a room which ends their movement phase. When moving, a villain cannot reverse their direction. A corridor space can only contain one villain. If a villain would end their movement on a space containing another villain or vampire, they must move in a different direction. A room may hold any number of villains. If no legal move is possible, the villain must suffer two damage and re-roll the movement die. 
When starting a turn inside a room, players must move their villain out of the room if able. Players may influence their villain's movement using cards and talents. The Black Die The Black Die represents the lighting conditions and random events that are to be found in the castle. Depending on what is rolled, additional rules for the player's turn are applied as follows. Darkness During movement, if the villain passes a trap, they must stop and trigger the trap, applying its effect. In addition, after moving, that player's villain may attack a villain in the same standard room instead of drawing a card. Normal rules for attacking apply. Candlelight The player may add or remove one from their movement total this turn. For example, a roll of three could now be considered a two, three or a four. Brazier The player may add or remove up to two from their movement total this turn. For example, a roll of three could be considered a one, two, three, four or a five. Castle event. Before moving, the player immediately draws the top card from the castle deck and follows the rules written on the card. It's worth noting, a player's roll can never be reduced to less than one. Action cards and talents can be played at any time during a player's turn, unless otherwise indicated. Movement example one. The player controlling the wanderer rolls the movement die and the black die together and rolls a one and the candlelight symbol. While the player has rolled a movement of 1, the candlelight effects means they can add or remove 1 from the result, so they can either move 1 or 2 spaces. The movement roll can never fall below 1, even with a candlelight effect in play. In this example, the wanderer could move to one of the 5 highlighted locations. Movement example 2. In this example, the player controlling the aristocrat rolls a 5 and the castle event symbol. The first thing the player should do is draw the top card from the castle deck. They draw the Children of the Night, which does not have a bearing on the player's movement, so let's ignore it for this scenario. Remember that villains must move their full movement total without reversing their direction. However, if they choose to enter a room, that will end their movement even if they haven't moved their full movement total. In the example above, the aristocrat could move to one of the five highlighted locations on the map. While the lowest movement total possible is one, there is no maximum. For example, villains can move more than six through the use of cards, talents and the black die effects. Resolution. After a villain has finished moving, apply the appropriate action depending on where they've ended their movement. Power of adjacency. Once per turn, power of adjacency can be claimed if you have landed in a corridor space adjacent to another villain. What this means is that you control the adjacent villain's movement on their next turn. On their turn, that player rolls to move their villain as normal, but you decide the direction they move, including whether to enter a room. If the player whose villain is being controlled has cards or talents that affect movement, for example the fate talent, that player can choose to play this as normal, but the controlling player decides how to implement any resulting modifiers. If more than one villain declares power of adjacency over another single villain, then the most recent villain to have declared power of adjacency is responsible for controlling the targeted villain's movement. Attack a villain if a villain ends their movement on a corridor space and they possess a weapon card, they can choose to attack another villain on a corridor space. Before attacking, the player should check that the villain they intend to target is in line of sight and is within range of the weapon card they are using. To attack, the player must play one weapon card. Reveal that card and do the following. All weapon cards will feature a number of icons which apply various rules. Here's an example of a weapon card. Relic. Relics are hugely powerful cards because unlike other cards, they aren't discarded after use. Finding a relic as quickly as possible is highly encouraged as a good strategy. Damage. The value next to this icon indicates the amount of health a villain loses when attacked with this weapon. Range. The number next to the range symbol indicates how many spaces away a villain can attack from, provided they have line of sight. Reveal. Cards that feature this symbol must remain face up in front of the player for as long as they possess the card. Revealed weapon and protection cards do count towards a player's hand limit. Some weapons have a range greater than one. These weapons can be used to attack a villain from the number of spaces equal to or less than the range value. The target villain suffers damage equal to the damage number specified on the weapon card and must reduce their health accordingly. Players may choose to play any number of action or protection cards to affect the outcome of an attack. A villain cannot attack another villain that's inside a room from outside a room, or vice versa. Unless otherwise stated, a villain can only attack once per turn, even if they have multiple weapon cards in their hand. Unless otherwise stated, 
Villains can't attack other villains inside a room. They can only attack in corridors, with the exception of the courtyard. However, there are situations in the game where villains will be able to attack while in a room. In this instance, the player must choose whether to attack or to draw a card when entering that room. Villains cannot attack and claim power of adjacency in a single turn. Here's a combat example. If the Wanderer did not want to use the power of adjacency, they may want to attack instead, provided they have a weapon card they can use. After declaring they intend to attack, that player would then reveal the weapon card they are using. This card has 1 range and 6 damage. If the Aristocrat had no way of preventing or reducing this, they suffer 6 damage and reduce their health tracker accordingly. However, on this occasion, that player has a protection card they decide to use in response. This has 5 protection. This reduces the damage suffered by 5, which means that the Aristocrat only takes 1 damage. While attacking, villains can only attack with 1 weapon card each turn. The defending villain can use any number of protection cards in response. Secret Doors If a villain ends their movement on a secret door space, their player may choose to place that villain on any unoccupied secret door and finish their movement there instead. Moving through a secret door is a continuation of a villain's movement. Therefore, if the villain's new location would allow them to attack or claim power of adjacency, then they are able to do so. For the purposes of attacking or claiming power of adjacency, secret doors are considered corridor spaces. A villain occupying a secret door space can be targeted as normal. Land on a trap. If a villain ends their movement on a trap, they must flip that token over and follow the rules for the type of trap they have landed on. Traps that have been flipped over remain in play and will trigger again if a villain lands on one. Bear trap. The villain suffers 3 damage. Trap door. The villain moves to the moat. Saw trap. The villain suffers 5 unblockable damage. Yubliette. The villain is slain. Secret door. The villain may move to any empty secret door space. This space is now a secret door for the remainder of the game. Players only trigger traps they land on, not that they pass while moving, unless darkness has been rolled on the black die. This villain got lucky, moving past the trap no problem. This villain, however, must stop and trigger the trap. Land on an arrow space. If the villain ends their movement on an arrow space, they are moved to the adjacent space indicated by the arrow. There are occasions where this would result in a player re-entering a room, in which case they should follow the instructions for entering that room. Note that there are two adjacent arrow spaces outside one of the entrances to the cemetery. Landing on either of these will move the villain to the cemetery. Entering a room. Villains enter the various rooms in the castle via the door symbols. Entering a room ends a villain's movement regardless of their movement total. Upon entering most rooms, the player will likely draw the top card of the match room deck. However, some rooms have more unique functions. Land on an empty corridor space. There is nothing to resolve. Advance to the next turn phase. 4. Other actions. The player now has another opportunity to play any number of actions and talents they would like to before ending their turn. End of turn. Once the player has finished playing their cards and talents, take the following steps. Activate any effects that state they take place at the end of a villain's turn, such as Strange Claw. Return used cards to the bottom of their decks. Discard down to the villain's hand limit, which is 6. Place any discarded cards face down at the bottom of the respective decks. Play passes to the next player. The various locations of Dracula's castle are represented as rooms upon the board. Each room will have different rules for players to follow upon entry. Rooms are divided into two categories, standard rooms and special rooms. Standard rooms are displayed on the map with a door symbol next to the name, while special rooms will feature a cross symbol. It's worth noting the ransack talent cannot be used in special rooms. Certain cards and talents will refer to whether a room is standard or special. Aside from that, they both function the same way. Certain rooms on the board feature text to remind players of important information. The Great Hall. The scene of countless feasts. This is one of the most accessible rooms in the castle. Upon entering the room, draw the top card from the Great Hall deck. The Master Bedroom. Once the resting place of choice for the master of the castle, it has long been abandoned. Upon entering this room, the player should immediately refresh their villain's Fate Talent token and then draw the top card from the Master Bedroom deck. The Torture Chamber. Beware the horrors of this room. Home to the Iron Maiden, which if drawn will result in instant death. Enter at your own risk. Upon entering the room, draw the top card from the Torture Chamber deck. 
Villains who enter the torture chamber have a chance of drawing the Iron Maiden, which will slay anyone who finds it. The Dungeon Rat infested cells are typically best avoided, and this section of the castle is no exception. Upon entering this room, draw the top card from the dungeon deck. The Trophy Room The home of countless trinkets and artifacts acquired over many centuries. Beware the traps. Upon entering this room, draw the top card from the Trophy Room deck. The Kitchen The crones have made the kitchen their home. This room is at the heart of the castle, which might serve to leave the unwary exposed. Upon entering this room, draw the top card from the kitchen deck. The Cemetery A haunted cemetery spans almost the length of the castle, making a quick, if somewhat risky, means of travel. Upon entering this room, draw the top card from the cemetery deck. The Courtyard A large, rubble-strewn courtyard with all manner of useful items left abandoned. The perfect location for an ambush. Upon entering this room, draw the top card from the courtyard deck. Unlike other rooms, players can attack when entering the courtyard. As for the combat rules, if a player chooses to attack in the courtyard, they do not draw a card. Once again, the ransack talent cannot be used in special rooms. The moat. A dark moat protects the castle. Beware the strong currents, as well as the creature that calls it home. Unlike other rooms, the moat cannot be entered directly. It is generally entered after landing on a trap. Upon entering the moat, the villain suffers two unblockable damage and misses the rest of their turn. On the villain's next turn, instead of rolling to move as normal, they must roll a single d6 to escape the moat. On a 1 to 3, the villain is unable to escape the moat and suffers one damage. Roll again. On a 4, the villain moves to the cemetery. On a 5, the villain moves to the vault. On a 6, the villain moves to an empty secret door space. If the villain fails to escape after three attempts, they must move to the cemetery. Villains may never attack one another in the moat, regardless of the effects of any cards. The gate. The castle gates are forbiddable. Abandon all hope ye who enter. The gate is an optional starting location for villains during the arrival. Villains that choose to begin from the gate draw two cards from their heirloom deck and choose one to keep, discarding the other. Villains cannot enter this room after the arrival. The Dark Tower. The master of the castle hatches his plots and schemes from this fearful location. Entrance is barred to all who fail to come with a gift. A villain can only enter the Dark Tower if they're in possession of a soul token. On entering, the player must discard a soul token in exchange for drawing the top two cards from the Dark Tower deck. The player may then decide which card to keep, returning the other to the bottom of the deck. Players may discard multiple soul tokens in this room. If players discard multiple soul tokens, they may draw and keep an additional card for each soul discarded. The following turn, before rolling to move, the player chooses an empty secret door space for the villain to begin their movement from. The Great Spiral Staircase Madness consumes any foolish enough to enter this place. Entering this room does not end a villain's movement. Instead, they must continue to move down towards the centre until they have moved their full movement total. On subsequent turns, the villain is trapped in the staircase and must continue to move down unless they roll a 6 on the movement die. If they do roll a 6, they must reverse their descent that turn and may leave through one of the doors if movement allows. If a player fails to escape and reaches the final space, they are slain. While in this room, players do not roll the black die. A villain inside this room cannot be targeted by other villains under any circumstances. Multiple villains can occupy the same space. Cards and talents that can be used to affect a player's movement roll, for example the fate talent, do not count towards rolling a 6. The Vault Resting place of the master. Villains can donate blood to temporarily become the vampire at this location. On entering the vault, if the vampire isn't currently active, that villain suffers four unblockable damage and becomes the vampire, at which point their turn ends. Follow the rules for the vampire. We'll cover the rules for the vampire later. If the vampire, however, is currently active, then the villain entering this room draws the top card from the vault deck. There are six different types of room cards that can be encountered while exploring the castle. Each card can only be used once unless otherwise indicated, after which it is discarded to the bottom of the deck from where it was drawn. Each card type in the game has its own unique frame to make it easy to see what type of card it is. Event Event cards represent the random encounters that will be experienced by the villains as they explore the rooms of the castle. 
Upon drawing an event, it should be revealed to all players and read out immediately. Weapons. These cards are generally used to initiate attacks and damage other villains. They will feature symbols to represent different rules that relate to that weapon. Protection. Protection cards are used to reduce the damage suffered during the game. Like weapons, they will feature symbols to represent different rules for the card. Protection cards can be played at any time. Actions. Action cards can be used at any point during a player's turn unless otherwise indicated. Some action cards can also be played during an opponent's turn. Curse. Curse cards are similar to events in that they are immediately revealed and read out to other players. Unlike events, villains must retain curses face up in front of them. They do not count towards a villain's hand limit. Vampire. Only a player active as the vampire can play these cards, though a villain can hold them in their hand. Unlike other cards, when a villain becomes a vampire, they do not set aside vampire cards. In Damnation the Gothic game, each player takes control of a villain, each one having access to unique talents which can be used to help them survive the night. Talent Tokens Each villain begins the game with three talent tokens. These are placed face up, the star side, in places on the villain's board marked with a star. Each token can be used to activate the specific talent that it's linked to. Talent tokens cannot be moved, and the maximum number that can be held is three. Using talents. Each villain has access to five talents. Two of these will be unique, while the other three are shared by every villain in the game. The villain board will explain the rules for how talents can be used and the effects that they have. In order to activate a talent, the villain must have an unspent talent token in the corresponding place on the villain's board. Once used, the talent token is flipped over to its reverse side to indicate the talent is spent. Some effects will instruct a player to refresh a talent token. To do this, the player selects a spent talent token and flips it over, which indicates that it is available to be used again. Each villain has a unique passive talent, which does not require a talent token to activate. Passive talents can be used any number of times. Passive talents are different in that they don't require talent tokens to activate. When and how passive talents can be used is explained on each villain's board. Villains may activate any number of talents at any time, unless otherwise stated. Soul Tokens Soul tokens can be gained in a number of ways, but are typically used in one of two ways. A player may discard soul tokens at any point during their turn to refresh one talent token for each soul discarded. Soul tokens may be traded at the Dark Tower in exchange for drawing powerful artifacts. Any number of soul tokens can be held by a villain. Once used, soul tokens are returned to the side of the board. In the unlikely event that there aren't any soul tokens available, the player does not gain a soul token. Slain Villains A villain will generally be slain in one of two ways. Firstly, their health is reduced to zero, or they are informed that they have been slain, for example, reaching the final space of the Great Spiral Staircase. Whenever a villain is slain, do the following. Reveal a Death Knell card. Their player chooses an unrevealed Death Knell card to flip over. Each of these cards introduces a new rule to the game. If at any point all death knell cards are revealed, the fall is immediately triggered. Who's responsible? If a villain is responsible for slaying another villain, their player receives a soul token and any souls that were held by the slain villain, and that villain's cards apart from any curses, which should be returned to the bottom of their respective decks. Responsibility for slaying a villain is determined under the following circumstances. A villain has made an attack that results in that villain's health reaching zero. The vampire has damaged a villain which has caused their health to reach zero. A villain has used the power of adjacency to move a villain into a trap which directly results in a villain being slain or their health reaching zero. Or a villain has used a talent that directly results in another villain being slain. If no player is directly responsible for another villain being slain, then their cards and any soul tokens they possess are placed in the cemetery. A villain who enters a cemetery may immediately collect these if they wish. The Vampire When a villain is instructed to become the vampire, they end their turn after completing the following steps. The villain's players set aside any cards that aren't vampire cards, their villain board, and places their standee in the vault. For as long as they remain the vampire, the player's villain in the vault cannot be targeted by any cards or effects, including damage from the fall. They take possession of the vampire board and place the vampire standee in the location where they became the vampire. Place the vampire timer token on space 5 of the vampire board. Shuffle and draw 3 cards from the vampire deck. The vampire is now active in the game. The vampire player can no longer use their original villain's talents and can only use vampire cards. 
The vampire is unlike other villains in the game and uses the following rules. Vampire turns. To move, the vampire player rolls 2d6 and keeps the highest result as their movement total. The vampire can move any number of spaces up to their movement total, including zero. Once each turn, the vampire player may choose to discard a vampire card to add that card's movement modifier to the movement total. The vampire cannot use secret doors, enter rooms, trigger traps or arrow spaces, gain power of adjacency and does not roll the black die. If the vampire does begin their turn inside a room, they must leave if able. At the end of the vampire turn, reduce the vampire tracker by 1. On the vampire's final turn, marked 1, providing they have the movement, they may enter the vault. If this happens, the player returns the vampire board, cards and standee to their original locations. On their next turn, the player will resume play with their original villain beginning from the vault. If the vampire tracker ever reaches the final space, the vampire is slain. If this happens, the player's villain is slain, and the vampire standee is returned to the vault. The vampire can never be permanently slain. If there are any villains present in the vault when the vampire returns to it, they are all slain, apart from the vampire player's original villain. Vampire Powers When becoming the vampire, the controlling player draws three cards from the vampire deck. Any number of these can be played on the vampire's turn, which are then discarded. At the end of their turn, if they have less than three cards in their hand, the vampire player draws one card. The vampire is immune from damage, power of adjacency, cards, talents, and all other effects, except for those that specify the vampire as their target. Bite. While moving, the vampire may choose to stop on a space adjacent to a villain and deal seven unblockable damage to them. If one or more damage is dealt, increase the vampire turn tracker by one. If the vampire successfully slays a villain, instead increase the tracker by two. Repel the vampire. If a card is played that repels the vampire, the vampire must roll a d6 and move that many spaces in the direction of the repelling player's choosing. The vampire may not enter a room or bite another villain during this movement. If a card is played that grants protection from the vampire, the vampire must end their turn on the closest adjacent space to the player from the direction they moved. When a villain is slain outside of the fall, it is not the end. Instead, that villain clings to life as a revenant, haunting the castle in an effort to return to the game. When a villain is slain, they flip their villain board to the haunt side and place their health tracker token face down at the bottom of their resurrection track. Haunt players interact with the game differently from villains and the vampire, using a deck of cards called the Haunt deck as they attempt to return to the game. On the Haunt player's turn, shuffle all the Haunt cards and deal three face up. If they have a pair of matching cards, they can choose to end their turn and apply the effect described on the Haunt board. Push your luck. If there isn't a pair, or even if there is and the player chooses to, they can draw another card from the Haunt deck face down and replace a face up card before revealing it. A player may do this a maximum of twice as they seek to make a set of cards. If the player reveals death cards as part of their initial draw of three cards, these are ignored. However, if the player chooses to push their luck as described previously and the card they reveal is the death card, their turn is immediately ended and any existing pairs are ignored. The player decreases their resurrection tracker by one and reveals a death knell card, if able. Resurrection If a player is able to move their tombstone token to the top of the resurrection track on their following turn, switch back to the villain side of the board and follow the rules for entering the game as outlined in the arrival, ignoring selecting a new character. The villain returns to the game on 4 health. 666. Six, six. Three cards from the Haunt deck are marked with the number 6. These count as ordinary cards unless the player is able to match all three. If this happens, the player immediately moves their resurrection tracker to the top of the track. If a villain returns in this way, the player may choose to have their villain begin from any standard room, regardless of the heirlooms they draw. Death with 666. Six, six. If the death card marked with a 6 is drawn when a player is pushing their luck and this directly results in a complete 666, then the player should follow the rules for 666. However, in addition, they should also reveal a death knell card, if able. If a player fails to make a set, they must pass and try again next turn. The Fall When all five death knell cards are revealed, the fall is triggered. The castle begins to crack and crumble around the remaining villains. The end is indeed nigh. From this point onwards, during a player's end of turn, their villain suffers one damage. Villains can no longer gain health. Any villains that enter the vault is slain, 
This doesn't apply to the vampire when he returns to the vault. Villains can no longer haunt the castle. These players are eliminated from the game. Winning the game. A player immediately wins the game if all other players are haunts or are eliminated. No further gameplay should occur. If there are only two non-haunt, non-eliminated players left and one is slain, that player doesn't reveal a death knell card. If a villain is instructed to return to the game on their next turn, and in the meantime all other villains are slain or eliminated, the remaining player wins. Knight of the Vampire Knight of the Vampire contains some new characters to use and some new cards. To use a new character, simply choose one during the arrival. The new cards should be shuffled into their respective decks. Any content from the Knight of the Vampire expansion has a moon symbol, so you can differentiate between the base game and this expansion. So that's how you play Damnation the Gothic game. If you have any questions about how to play this, leave them in the comments below.